Is it recording? Yeah. Good. That's the important way. Okay. Well, we can't read anything else. We have an entire diagram. I do have an entire diagram. Okay. I, just, I don't know what to do about that. Like, I can't move the diagram. So, the diagram's over there. Okay. Whoops. Right there. We're good. So an introduction to metaethics. Metaethics can be most easily good question. Sorry, uh, I never got called for Oh. What's your name? Yeah. What? How do you spell it? Okay, you're supposed to be dead, though. Marshall. You should have been called. Yeah, I mean, I'm over here. Uh, Collins and Anthony are the most serious. Yeah, that got. Uh, that is delayed because Rebecca Colon is not here yet. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. It's just so people don't like not show up to anything. Fine. So, an introduction to metaethics. Metaethics can be most easily understood in relation to normative and applied ethics. The field of normative ethics asks questions about what are the moral principles by which I should live my life. When, if ever, is it all right to lie? How strong is my obligation to give to those in need? Under what conditions should I turn in a friend? Applied ethics uses those principles and applies them to specific contexts and situations to understand the way those implications work themselves out within various human practices. Let's say normative theory like deontology may say that it should not use humans as a means to an end, and an applied ethicist may then take that principle and attempt to figure out what that means for a business person. Is it ethical to outsource jobs or run misleading commercials, for instance? Does that form a kind of lie? Is that using customers as a means to my own profit? Does that make sense? Now, there's a third common type of question that deals with ethics. Questions like, how do I know what is ethical? Do human beings have free will? Or are God's com commands necessarily good? These questions all fall under the realm of metaethics, as they are assumptions that underpin or interact with the claims of a normative ethical theory. I just need to be about the camera. Oh, sorry. Well, it's not particularly precise. It is an extraordinarily useful way to understand and sort through ethical claims made in the background. Sure. Consider an analogy to the world of science. Now, admittedly, I know almost nothing about science and I'm just going to make up all this stuff. But we're going to pretend science works this way. Okay. Some physicists spend their time trying to come in physical laws like E equals MC squared, F equals MA, the second law of thermodynamics, etc. Right. Some other physicists work on those problems. While some physicists work on those problems, others attempt to that work in concrete context. Robotics, landing on the moon, um, launching missiles, other sciencey things, I don't know. The work of the first group corresponds to normative ethics. Right? The, group, the work the second group applies to applied ethics. However, there's still other questions that physicists need answers to. What makes one theory of physics better than another theory of physics? Is it elegance? Simplicity, predicted accuracy, explanatory power? And how do we define and understand this criteria? What are physical laws? Can chemistry be reduced to physics? What is the best way to conduct an experiment? All of these questions are not answered by physics or engineering. I can't do a physics experiment to figure out the best way to do physics. Right? Nor can I do physics to tell me what type of physical theory is best. Right? What this means is they are instead background questions about which scientists make various assumptions, sometimes justified and sometimes not, which implicate and affect how they go about doing their job. Ethical theory has all those same background questions and assumptions. What makes one theory better than another? What are ethical laws? Can moral rules like don't steal be reduced to some broader command like the golden rule? What is the best way to study that? Metaethics simply the project of study and defining and defending those background assumptions. Every ethical framework on debate makes a host of metaethical assumptions. If you say, for instance, that utilitarianism is better than deontology because it treats all humans morally equally, you are making metaethical assumptions, like all humans are morally equal. 
if an ethical theory better with respects that equality, that ethical theory is better. Human beings can be added and compared as collective groups. Equality is respected through equalizing experiences. Each of these assumptions may be reasonable or unreasonable without affecting the reasonability of other associated assumptions that it has. Right? Make sense? Anyone unclear up to this point? No one's unclear? Okay. Oh. Uh, so, meta-ethics are the like, general assumptions or general questions that are asked that are ethics? Not under ethics, above ethics. Uh, yeah, like above ethics. So, like, deontology is like kind of meta-ethics, right? right. So, so deontology the assumes things like what are human persons? Or what is the will? Right? Because Kant is like, act only according to the good will. Or what is a will? How do we will things? What constitutes a good will? How does it differ from a bad will? Can we see a will? Can I touch a will? Can I smell a will? Can I do an fMRI scan to find the will? Can the will be affected by, ma by magnetic impulses, like an fMRI machine? I don't know. Actually, no. The answer is no. <laughs> you can't do any of those things to a will. I don't know why, but I didn't know the answer to that. That's a very easy question. Any other questions? Yeah. So, It's just those questions that ethical assumptions, ethical theories assume, right? So it's not like one thing, right? Like in the same way, science has a whole host of questions that scientists don't answer, but they assume answers to. Like what makes one scientific theory about another? What is the scientific method? How do we do it? You can't use a scientific study to learn that, but scientists just make arguments for or against them without science. Likewise, when you make an ethical argument, you make all these assumptions about what is a good argument, how ethics should work, what makes this sort of valuable ethical thing, what doesn't, right? And you're appealing to all that stuff. Yeah. So is meta-ethics just the discipline of studying those background things? Right? It doesn't have to be questions that can be given answers, but if I give answers to these things, I'm engaged in meta-ethics. Yeah. So like, what are the assumptions that like all ethical theories have? Like, what are the meta -ethics? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to see, but like, every sort of background assumption, everything that an argument assumes when you're making an ethical argument is all a meta-ethical assumption. Okay? So, for instance, it is a meta-ethical assumption that says human beings are equal. It is a very true meta-ethical assumption, I would think. It's a different meta-ethical assumption that says, if humans are equal, we should treat them all the same. That is, I think, a very false meta-ethical assumption, right? You don't expect equality of people if you give someone with dyslexia and someone without dyslexia the same test. You might treat them the same, but not equally. Does that make sense? So, meta-ethics is the attempt to analyze these underlying assumptions an argument make and assess their viability. Any questions about that? So someone, everyone here can explain back to me what metaethics is, if I were to ask them. All of it? <laughs> metaethics is the set of background assumptions right, which an ethical theory presupposes. How are we doing? Good? All right, we'll move on. From a strategic perspective, meta-ethics are commonly used in debate to act as constraints on frameworks and framework warrants. For example, I may present a meta-ethical claim that the basis of proper moral reasoning is in Kantian practical reasoning, or in subverting oppressive power structures. Both of these are meta-ethical claims. They say, morality has to do X, okay? And they then use this meta-ethical claim to say, your ethical theory fails to meet X, and therefore is not a legitimate form of moral reasoning, okay? Let's take the second example of, meta of an ethical theory that says, for various epistemic or methodological reasons, the project of ethical theory should be first oriented towards resisting oppression. And even my opponent wins that their ethical theory is super elegant, or was commanded by God, or has all sorts of other positive aspects to it. I can argue that none of that matters, because none of them were actually helpful in accomplishing the first goal of ethical theorizing. That's what makes metaethics so highly strategic, because it really acts like a value criterion for the value criterion debate. In the same way, the value criterion constrains what offense matters on the contention. This is the only thing that links back to the value criterion matter when you argue about the contention. So, too, the meta ethic constrains what matters when you argue about which ethical theory is true. 
This is only ethical if you meet these criteria are true. Make sense? Now, the way you debate on metaethics is obviously going to be very different depending on which metaethics you run and what your opponent metaethics are, and it's going to depend on your own personal debate style. But what this lecture is going to try to do is not give you an explanation for how to answer or engage in metaethics debates directly, but instead address some background terminology and some common metaethical ideas that are going to be present if you were to do your own research on metaethics. Make sense? Cool. So, the first question right, that I'm going to talk about in terms of metaethics is are all statements truth act? Okay? Anyone think they know what it means for a statement to be truth act? Yeah. Can it be reduced to a yes or no? Maybe. But I don't think so. Because I think your statement was just truth act there, but the answer is maybe. So, what truth that means is that the statement can be true or false. Right? It's the sort of statement that has the property of being answerable with a yes or no answer, even if it can't necessarily always be answered that way. So, an example of a truth app statement is triangles have three sides. My name is Marshall. Either elephants have tusks or ants have antlers. Right? Each of those statements can be either true or false. Right? It's only going to be a statement that can't be true or false. <coughs> that we still make. Yeah. How old are you? Questions, right? Probably not statements, right? But yeah, definitely. That's a type of linguistic act that cannot be said to be true or false. Your question can't be true or false, right? What's another thing that can't be true or false? This sort of linguistic activity. Opinions? What do you mean? Like if I said dogs are the best. No, I think that could be true or false. Well, you can say, my opinion is that dogs are the best, and that yeah, can also be true or false. What if I said it is opinion? That dogs are the best? Yeah, we can debate that. <laughs> this whole, like, opinion can be true or false is all nonsense. My opinion is right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you always hear in middle school, like, no, opinions are like, this space will be able to disagree with me. Sure, you can disagree with me. Right. But the teachers can just try to make you feel better, and like, yeah, Marshall's just better. No. <laughs> I don't like What's an example? Another example. Alright, what about this one? Go to the store. Can it be true or false? No. So commands aren't true or false. Right. You can't analyze when a command is true or false. It's not that type of linguistic activity. Or another one. Yay, puppies! It can't be true or false, it just expresses the mode of reaction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, one of the primary metaethical questions is if an ethical theory is true, if ethics is truth act. If we can say one ethical statement is true and another ethical statement is false, but if instead ethics engage in a different sort of activity. So, philosophers who argue that morality is truth act, <coughs> moral statements can be true or false, are called cognitivists. Okay? Cognitivism is the claim that morality can be either true or false. And a moral statement can be either true or false. Those who say that is not true are called non-cognitivists. They are not cognitivists. They're really not creative with the whole name either. But that's okay. So, non-cognitivists fall into a couple of different types. One version is called emotivists. So emotivists say moral statements aren't true or false, because moral statements are just expressions of emotion. If I say you ought to go to the store, what I'm really saying is, yeah, go to the store, yay, store. If I say you ought not, murder, I say, boo, murder, no, murder, sad. Right. <laughs> and when I'm making an argument for an ethical theory, I'm not trying to convince you this ethical theory is true. I'm just trying to make you feel the same way I do. Right. So if I give you an argument, murder is bad because think about, you know, poor Susie without a parent. Right. I'm trying to get you to be like, oh, I'm trying to make you feel sad. So my ethical argument is trying to evoke a sort of emotive reaction from you. Right? And so when you make a moral statement, what you do is expressing the amount of content that you have to have. Okay? And there are different reasons why this might be true. Right? Like one of the classic arguments is that reason or true statements don't cause us to behave one way or the other. Right? Emotions are what motivate us to take action. And since morality is concerned with action, it must be based in emotion. Right? This is an argument by a guy named David Hume. They're also arguing say we, all, we don't care if you believe the same things as me as long as you have the same sort of opinion, the sort of sentiment of it. Right? 
No, it's not trying to convince you. We have a moral debate about whether or not you should get a raise because you work for me. If you give me an argument, I'm like, okay, I agree, but for a different reason. You're not going to be like, oh, no, I want you to give me a raise for my reason, not your reason. No. You'd be like, okay, we agree on the conclusion. That's the point, right? Our emotions, our attitudes are the same, even if our reasons would be different. Right? There might be different reasons to think that sort of a mode of account of morality is true. The morality is not true or false, but it's a based expression of emotion. In contrast to emotivism, are the people called prescriptivists, okay? And prescriptivists are people who say that moral statements are just giving orders. So when I say go to the store, I'm giving you an order. When I say you ought to go to the store, I'm just saying anyone should go to the store in your situation. So a prescriptivist just says when I make moral judgments, I'm making a universal prescription. I'm giving an order, a standing order, for anyone in any situation that's like that. Does that make sense? Right, and that seems to be something like what we're doing, right? Because when I make a moral statement, what I'm really saying is go do this, right? You are not murder. Don't murder. Right? There's a pretty close parallel there. Make sense? Good. So those are both theories, which would say the moral statements, the way you guys debate them doesn't make any sense. If you debate these moral theories based on like which type of theory is true, but moral statements aren't true or false. That's like being like, which emotion is true? Right? Is it actually sad? You can't debate, is it sad? You can say, do we feel sad? Does that make sense? And so you can't debate these things objectively. And so the way that a lot of people would justify the ethical theory would not make sense if motivism is correct. Yeah? What do you have in the lack of universal prescriptions? Quasi realism. Okay. I'm not going to go into that though. I just put it up there because it's a fun word. <laughs> but it's way too complicated to try to explain Blackwell's quasi realism. But if you want to look it up, feel free to. Okay, does that make sense? So that's sort of very, very, very brief overview to the sort of non-cognitivist tradition in ethics, right? The claim that morality is based in some sort of sentimental orientation, right? Or in some sort of prescriptive order-based orientation towards other human beings, or to animals, or whatever. Right? Now, some people disagree with them, I think rightly, and say, no, morality actually is true to that. Moral statements can be true or false, right? The statement you ought not lie is a true statement, right? not just one that expresses my sort of emotional content. Okay? So the cognitivists can be split into a whole host of categories. The first disagreement between cognitivists is some cognitivists think cognitivism is true, morality can be true or false, and all moral statements are false. This is a form of skepticism known as error theory. It's advocated for by a person named J.L. Mackey. Okay? Those of you who read my answer in the sketch we've already talked about it. Right? And I can go into a lot of detail. But it says, yeah, most things can be true or false, and they happen to always be false. Okay? So, we just can't know more statements. They don't mean anything. They have meaning, but that meaning can never be grounded in anything. However, most philosophers aren't error theorists. Right? It's kind of a sad position to be in. It's like, no, oh, it's all false. There are no more theories. Now, if you want to do a really weird thing, there are people who like math error theorists who are like, yeah, math can be right or wrong, but all math statements are wrong. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I actually don't know. I never read any of them. I just know they exist. They might not actually say anything like that. I'm just guessing that's what they say. <laughs> that was probably not justified in my respect. So, that's the first sort of division, right? Among people who think morality can be true or false, there are the error theorists and the non error theorists. Now, the next categorization, right, those who think that some moral statements can be true, or that moral statements can be true or false, and at least some are true, is the question of, are these moral statements mind-dependent or mind-independent? Okay? Do moral statements exist in virtue just of our minds, or do they instead exist in virtue of reality itself? Okay? So, statements like 2 plus 3 equals 4 would seem to be true even if no human had ever thought of. But other sort of statements seem like they depend on the mind in order to get ground to them. So for instance, someone give me a number of how many chairs are on this room. It doesn't have to be actually right, but we'll pretend it is. 42. 22. 37. 22. 32. That's a massive underestimate. I'm going 42. That seems that right. Okay. So suppose there are 42 chairs in this room. Is that statement true even if no human mind had ever thought it? No. 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 Right, because the whole concept of a chair, right, is a mental category. 
There is no naturalness of chair, right? There's nothing in reality that just is chair. If humans never exist, never invented chairs, and like a tornado blew through a quarry and lifted up and created this thing that looks just like this thing, it still wouldn't be a chair, right? Just because it happened to happen, right? It would just be a weird rock. Does that make sense? Anyone actually be weird rock is weird is itself a mental category. Okay? So it's a question of is morality the sort of thing that is just a thing that our minds construct, like chairs? Or is instead something independent of the mind? Right? Like math. There's some people think math is a construction, we're not gonna get into that. But if we construct morality, then how is the everyone think about morality Well, doesn't everyone here use the term chair? Just because it's constructed doesn't mean we have to construct it differently. Right? If all of us counted the number of chairs in this room, we'd all agree on the right answer. But like, I'd probably miscount it first, but eventually you convince me I'm wrong. Right? So we can still reach agreement about constructed notions. Does that make sense? Make sense? Yeah. So mind dependency means that like, it only exists like, because you didn't exist in great ideas, your mind is like in wrong. Right, so mind dependency means that the human mind constructs in some significant sense the content of moral theories. Okay, it is what gives morality its form. Yeah, go on. That's true, would morality be the thing that separates humans from animals? No, because a lot of people think animals will also construct morality. <coughs> and there are also some humans who probably don't construct morality. I was just saying that, like, so, like, some versions of constructing the social constructiveness. They say morality is constructive within certain societies. Well, animals also seem to have sort of hierarchical societies where they punish each other for deviation from established norms, right? Like, certain macaw societies have, like, social rules that they expect other monkeys to follow them, okay? If that's true, then it seems to indicate that they have a sort of rudimentary moral system. If the sort of social constructivist account is correct about what morality is. Does that make sense? You still seem confused. Okay, it's a good place to be. So, amongst the theories that are mind dependent, they say the mind creates morality, right? Basically, these are all called constructivist accounts, right? The mind constructs moral truths around it. And the different approaches to this, right? One version of constructivism is called contractarianism. This is the idea that we construct morality based upon some sort of mutual contracting, right? So like, I won't kill you, and you don't kill me. And we both agree to that rationally. And therefore, this sort of gives rise to moral rules. But it's not like it just exists out there, the truth that we shouldn't kill. It's something we both recognize that neither of us want us to kill the other person. And so we would rationally agree to this sort of contract if we were to come about and make it. Yeah. So does that mean if everybody had the idea of like, not killing someone, they don't get killed, we would have like, no no, just because it's more, just just because we pick the right moral theory doesn't mean we're all going to follow it. And even if we all agree not to kill each other, we might like, babe, but we can kill each other in self-defense. And I would like misinterpret you coming at me and be like, oh, I'm in danger. Does that make sense? So, it'd probably still be killing us, but you have the right idea. But this is the idea that we sort of rationally construct morality via the system of hypothetical contracts, right? Authors for this are people like David Gautier. Thomas Hobbes, John Rawls, another social contract theorist who is specifically how state morality particularly is constructed via these sort of hypothetical contracts. Make sense? The important thing to note is he's not saying that actual contracts are the basis for morality. That would be bizarre, right? They're not saying that morality can just change if we make different contracts. Instead, it's saying that a sort of hypothetical rational system of thought of mutual interest and agreement would come up with these sort of conclusions. We would agree to these things if we were to think about it rationally and try to make agreements with one another. Not that we actually had done so. Make sense? So that's one theory of constructivism. Another is a sort of Kantian style constructivism. Right? So there are people who defend a sort of deontological theory that says, because I make choices and choose certain things, I give them value. Right? So in making choices, I value certain things over others. 
but that is to recognize that human beings are a source of value and therefore have this sort of infinite and unconditional value as being the source of all other value and should be used to make an end. For more information on that, you should go to an introduction to Kantian ethics like last Wednesday or whatever. Or find me at office hours. But, so that would be the idea that we, in the act of choosing things, construct a sort of system of moral priority in which human beings have this sort of preeminence and moral import. Does that make sense? Any questions about what constructivism says? No? Cool. So in contrast to constructivists, but still in the cognitivist realm, are what we call moral realists. And moral realists are people who think that morality is mind independent. Right? It's just out there in a sort of objective sense. One well, big reason to think that moral realism is false. That there isn't just sort of out there morality that we can know. Yeah, but presumably different cultures also have different like, scientific beliefs. We don't think they're just constructed by our minds. Yeah, David? So like mind independent, would you say the theory of like, um, theories of morality are just like floating around and it's like if people just adopt them based on the fact that like... They right, they're like, like mathematical truths. truths. Mathematical truths are just sort of out there. We can sort of assess them and know them. We don't create them. Cool. It says morality is the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, what it's in the think of moral beliefs are like interconnected between like within like like if people have different moral views on any one given topic, would it just say that is that, that is like in sub like those two views are different subsets of what would altogether be considered morality? Yeah, right. So it'd probably be pretty similar to like you believe probably both the Pythagorean theorem, right? And you also believe the two plus two plus four. Those are both subsets of mathematical truth. Cool. Right. So you should not vote to not steal those subsets of moral truth. So let me explain some different versions of realism, and then we'll talk about some arguments for and against realism and for and against constructivism. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, they don't have to. They'll just be wrong if they don't. Yeah. But um, at that point, can we draw a contrast between morality and like and math? Because like there are different ways to prove that math exists. Like, would you would you as a person specifically say that like the mind dependent are correct or the mind independent? Me personally? Yes, you personally. Uh, mind independent. Right. I'm a realist about morality. That's my personal belief. All right. So categories. Of, yeah. Like, couldn't it be argued that like even things like math. Are kind of like in the metaphysical realm, like it is our like, idea of what we construct it to be. So, like, our notion of two plus two is like we think might be two, but it really might not be. So, like, the, like our separate, like, we create separate beliefs that, like, every person be valued independently, but like, in certain cultures, like, meaning one in which they would not isolate, for example, like. So it's like all these social constructs instead of a natural phenomenon that has already existed. Perhaps, but presumably you think that like different cultures would all fundamentally be two plus two plus four, right? I mean, yeah, that's because like we come to adopt that standard as like I think the way that I heard this from um, like Dr. Curry, he was like explaining it in the sense that we have like adopted the Eurocentric method of how they evaluate systems of thought. So like they would like like colonize different areas and they would spread that like idea that two plus two has to equal four. So you think that there were cultures before colonization who did not think two plus two made four? I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying like if, isn't that like a possibility? Probably. I I don't think so. Okay. Maybe. Torn. I kind of disagree, but at the same time, I understand where this from. But I think that was from your uh, philosophy lecture, where he was saying in the metaphysical realm, there's certain things that are like cultural standards, which define different things. And I think you, I think it was either you or Dr. Curry that said in other cultures they believe different things, and in, in the uh, westernized cultures there's certain ideas. So I don't really understand. Really, they said that math didn't really come from personalized culture, but it was more like it was always known that if you have this and then you have something that looks like it's more, I mean, it's simply known that you just added more you know, towards whatever you had yeah. before. Yeah, so I think one thing to add here, right, is there's going to be differences between 
what I'm going to call epistemic claims and metaphysical claims. These are important terms to know for metaphysics debate. Metaphysical claims are claims about how reality is. Things like, does God exist? Do humans being have free will? How does math work? Epistemic claims are instead claims about how we know things. Right? So how do I know what 2 plus 2 equals 4? How do I have access to that information? And it could be that I only know these things because I was taught it in society. Right? So like, I only know that the structure of an atom has like electrons moving around neutrons and protons because I've learned that in society. Right? So I only have access to that epistemically because of society. But nevertheless, I don't think that society was created that truth. So I think it has metaphysical reality outside of society, but I only epistemically know it because of society. So I think it might address some of your questions. So a chao would exist, but it probably would not necessarily be a chao without minds. Right? So it being a chao is a teleological category. Right? The idea of a chao is something you sit in. So if there was no human being who had the idea of like sitting, there wouldn't be that purpose in the chair. So because chair has this sort of teleological component to it, this end of purposiveness to it. Yeah. Um, that's the true path, like statements can be true or false. Like what if I eat a piece of cake and I'm like, whoa, this is the best cake ever. And then I pass the cake to Reedy and I'm like, yo Reedy, try some of this cake. And she's like, dude, this cake sucks. Like, are we both right? Like, because no, you were probably wrong, and you've not had good enough cake. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Um, <laughs> can you repeat metaphysical claims? Metaphysical is a description of how reality actually is. So does God exist? Are there number? Can we answer That depends on your theory of epistemology, how we know things. Kant thought no. I think yes. Sure, so society might give us access to like mathematical truths and things. Be a sort of system of deliberative consensus. There are people like Edmund Husserl who make arguments of that sort. Yeah. So what's the difference between uh, metaphysical claims and like descriptive claims then? Is that a dumb question or no, it's not. <laughs> descriptive claims are just claims that how things about how things are, as opposed to how things should be. But that's true for like, like the statement you tell is true, is a descriptive claim about the true ethical theory, right? But it might not be a metaphysical claim for my life, it's just a social construct. My life that really exists, right? Likewise, this claim is true. Harry Potter is friends with Ron Weasley, but it might be a metaphysical claim. So it's descriptively true. It may not be metaphysical because there's no actual Harry Potter or Ron Weasley who could be friends. I, I don't get it. Hmm? I, I still don't get it. So Harry Potter and Ron don't exist, right? Sure. Wait, have you read Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Harry Potter and Ron yeah. don't exist, right? Yeah. So they're not real metaphysical entities. Okay. But it's descriptive. Okay, I got you. Now, I think there are actually theories of metaphysics that would say they do have some sort of existence, right? But I don't want to get into that right now. It's just an illustration. Descriptive is probably a broader system. We can make descriptive claims out of epistemology or about metaphysics. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so let's go on for a little while. So realism, right, the claim that there are these two more theories can be split into a couple of different approaches. One approach is what's called intuitionism. And so this is the belief that these base moral truths Okay, or known by the sort of intuitive understanding we have, the sort of basic set of moral axioms like murder is wrong, people matter, quality good, right? That you can't further justify in the same way that math is made of a certain basic axiom, like the law of non-contradiction, uh, number is conserved, um, aggregate, aggregation is possible, fixed quantities, sort of basic premises like Euclid's axioms of geometry, things like that. Right? And you take these things you just sort of know and you can't prove, and then build up the correct theory via them. So likewise, intuition is what we claim we had sort of basic moral intuitions we just sort of know and kind of build up this ethical theory. All right? Now there's two versions of intuition that I want to talk about. One is called reflective equilibrium, which is the claim that we don't actually have basic intuitions. Right? I don't have like an intuition that says motor is wrong in the abstract. What I have is an intuition that's like motoring in this situation is wrong, motoring in this situation is wrong, motoring in this situation is wrong. And I take all of these 
specific scenarios, and I try to sort of reflect between them, like, okay, these different examples, and I'm like, well, what about this? And I use like thought experiments and sort of push back and forth and try to create the right moral theory, which best computes all the intuitions I have. Okay, I'm trying to like fix my intuitions as I'm like, wait, this seems inconsistent, things like that. The fucking equilibrium. The idea, right, of an equilibrium is the point at which you know you sort of move back and forth, you move back and forth until eventually you don't move anymore. Because you reach a stasis point where everything fits together equally and sort of consistent. Another version of intuitionism is what I'm going to call Morean intuitionism, which quite what M O O R E I A N. It, it's Morean, but then you might have to drop the E because the language is weird. But you might not drop the E. I have no idea. Oh, that's totally wrong. This is why I make this cake up all my lectures. All right. So, um, this version is a little different. So this says that claims of goodness are basic categories. So, let's take an example. Who you can describe what a unicorn is? Good. So a unicorn is created through a combination of the notion of a horse and form. Right. Who you can describe what a horse is? Form. Four-legged beast. Okay. It's a beast with four legs and these other criteria. So we can build it up from the idea of animal and four leg and like quadruped and things like that. Okay. Who here can describe what a yellow circle is? Yeah. Um, it is a shape with no angle. I mean, um, no right angles. Or the angles is completely round. Okay. So you're not quite right because I would also probably do an oval. But, yeah, right. It's a, like an elliptical thing with a collateral radius, and it is also yellow. Now, if you look at Strippy, who can describe to me what yellow is? Yellow is a color. It is perceived by our eyes to be um, a combination of Orange and violet. No, no. That's not right. <laughs> 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 I spell a lot better than I. Yellow is primary color. It is reflected. I spell like the most Is it? I can't get it. No, no, no. So, wait. What you're giving me is a scientific description, right, of what yellow is. But let's say I've never seen anything yellow before. But I didn't know that scientific description. Like I'd actually studied light and had like proved that yellow was that. And then I suddenly see something yellow that I'd never seen before. Did I learn something new about what yellow is? No. No? Well, if you tell you what it is, like if you tell you that yellow is But I don't, you think I know what yellow is just from hearing that description? No, you don't. No. No, so I learned something new. I learned what yellow was. Yeah. But you just said you don't know. <sighs> Are you being told it's yellow? All right. I live in a, I don't want to go into the philosophy of mind right now. Really quick, okay? I live in a box, okay? But I'm a super famous vision scientist. And I've done learned everything I know about vision. But my room has always been entirely black and white, okay? And gray, right? But I have studied everything there is to know about color and how it all works in the brain, how it reflects in neurons and things like that. I know all of that. And then for the first time, I go outside and I see a school bus pass by. Do you really think I have not learned anything new about what yellow is? Yes, you do. Okay, good. So then what you said is not the description of yellow. Because that person could have that and still not know what yellow is. Okay. It seems like yellow is not something that can be divided into parts and explained. It is a sort of basic experience right, that is present. So Moore is going to argue the same thing is true of categories like good. The good cannot be further divided right, into subsidiaries. Instead, it's just a basic category you know about and can't prove or understand any more than how it is. And all it is to do is try to increase the amount of good. So he's a sort of intuitionist who derives sort of utilitarian approach, like we know things as good or bad, and that's all sort of their similarity. Other versions of a similar sort of approach are called Ross's deontology, R-O-S-S. -S. You have hints of sort of like prima facie moral import certain things, like not lying. That's sort of basic moral category that can't further derive. So those are the two different approaches to intuition. One that says we have intuitions about basic categories, and one that says no, we actually have intuitions about like scenarios, and then we kind of like figure out the basic categories by reflecting on them. Make sense? 
Now, the, a dimming version of realism says that morality is not known in intuition, but instead actually exists in the natural world. Okay? So these are going to be called what we call naturalists. And so they're different types of naturalists. Some are what I call Aristotelian naturalists, who hold that goodness is a property that exists in a thing based upon its purpose or teleology, based on the ends that it pursues, the sort of thing it becomes. So an acorn, right, has a good of becoming an oak tree because that is sort of its end. It's the thing it orients itself towards. Right? An acorn becomes an oak tree. Okay? That is the sort of end of the acorn. Right? And so the good acorn is one that grows to be an oak. Right? Likewise, the end of a toaster is to toast my bread. So who here thinks a really good toaster? Who here can describe what a really good toaster would do for me? Yeah. And toast a lot of bread and toast it quickly and toast it well. Okay. So it toasts lots of bread, and you toast it quickly, toast it well. I would pretend it like toasts a manual con space onto the bread. I think that would be a pretty good toaster. I think it would also probably like juice my oranges while it toasts the bread. And it makes me fresh juice orange juice. It maybe even has its own built-in tree, so it just harvests its own oranges from itself. In order, like, this would seem like a great toaster. Right. Yeah. How is that different from like constitutivism, which says like if, like if a, to a good toaster is like one that toasts well or something? Is that fulfilled? Constitutivism is just a form of Aristotelianism. Okay. Okay. So, in contrast, right? So we know goodness is the capacity to toast evenly, massive amounts and in the shape of manual Kant, right? Now suppose my car, I turned it on in the morning, it's like, no, it's not working. I'm trying to get to work, I try to turn it on. I'm like, ah, I look under the hood, and each time I turned it on, it produced a perfectly toasted piece of toast, right? <laughs> With the face of manual Kant on it. I'm like, and I'm like, this is the greatest car ever. <laughs> Maybe, but it actually is kind of a bad car, right? If the car doesn't drive anywhere, but just toast toast, it's not a good car. So this is going to argue that what we mean by good is dependent on the sort of thing it is, based on sort of purpose. Right? So the purpose of a toaster is different from the purpose of a car, so it makes a toaster good, and then what makes a car good. Okay? So more categories like good are found in the natural world based upon the purposes or natural teleologies that things have. <coughs> yeah? Uh, how can purpose be mind independent? Hmm? How can purpose be mind independent? Because the acorn goes into the oak whether any human thinks it or not. I don't get how purpose is derived from that. Well, focus is a mental category. We think of TUO, so end. Right? Sort of orientation the thing is towards. Right? Like you can make a calculator calculate something, it's purpose to get the right answer. Even if no mind in the calculator thinks that that's its purpose. It's just sort of what it does, it's its end. Yeah. So, does that apply to people? Like, would the Aristotelian naturalist apply that to a person? I'm a good person if I do a certain thing? Yeah. Okay. So good people are ones that have certain virtues, right? They are social creatures, they can be cooperative, so they like to tell the truth, and they take care of children, and they do the sort of things that make a human flourish, right? It's those sort of purposes that humans have. Okay. There are also versions of this, right? So yeah. Another version of naturalism is not, oh, you have a question? Isn't that also the gun for like a good gun fires a bullet and gives a bullet to harm? So a good gun harm. No. Um because a good gun uh might not fire a bullet. It could just deter anyone from attacking you. Okay. And that could be my focus of having a gun. Like there are several. Right, we had sort of deterrent effect. Likewise, the resolution not talking about folks of guns, it's talking about folks of governments. Um so that's what's seen in naturalism. Another form of naturalism is what I'm going to call Cornell realism. Okay? And Cornell realism is the belief that morality sort of exists on natural things. So things like pain and pleasure have a certain naturalness of good or bad, based on the sort of things that experience it, and things like that. Okay? So there are actually these real properties that exist in a thing. Right? And they exist sort of like a construct that exists on top of it. Right? So anyone know what the term supervenience means? No? What do they teach you guys in high school? High school sounds awesome. Okay, so supervenience, okay, is the idea that um, certain properties exist on top of a thing, right, and have properties, 
even if they are not physically present in one thing. So for instance, that's actually a very bad definition, but I think an illustration will make it clearer. Okay? Um, the good definition is all super technical. Who here thinks there is an unemployment rate in the US? Yeah. Who here can point to the unemployment rate? Where, can point to the value. You can point to the number. Yeah. But I want to find the actual unemployment rate. Like, where is it? Like, is it located in the Federal Reserve somewhere? Like, they have this room which is like all the unemploymentness as a percentage is like coalesced. They stick like a thermometer in there and measure the unemployment rate. But, and so, things like the unemployment rate or the inflation rate, there's an inflation rate in the US. But it's not like I can see the inflation rate in any individual economic purpose. It just exists on top of all the economic purchases. Right? But it's still real and still affects my purchases. So I'm going to buy more or less things based on the inflation rate, even though the inflation rate only exists on top of the individual purchases I make. Does that make sense? So it's going to argue morality is the same thing. It sort of supervenes on top of sort of human social interactions. It makes some good or some bad. Right? Even though you can't like, identify any sort of reductive sense. Yeah. So what we look for super supervenience. Super it starts with S U P E R and then venience. I know you have spelled that. Like convenience. Or... I don't know. Okay. So that's that idea, right? And so that's a not the morality. One last form of realism is divine command theory, right? Um, morality is based on God's commandments, right? So what God says is good. Go on. Was this that case you were reading yesterday? That was actually not a version of divine command theory. It just said God existed, but he used different metaphorical implications from that. David? What's on the cards now? No. They're online, so I can debate it with what you can we cut them. All right. Um, so this is a broad overview to some of the common terminology used in metaphorical literature. There's obviously lots, lots more that we could talk about. Right? We're running short on time, though. So let me just field a couple of last questions. Right, about anything you might hear in debate that you want covered. Yeah, I mean, it's not one of those questions. It's just, um, like, to back it up a bit, you started out with, like, all moral theories are going to be, like, truth apps, right? Like, if they're true or false. So All cognitive theories. Okay, so why does it have to start from there? Why can't it start from, like, whether they're good or bad? Like, why can't that be the question? Like, i.e., if morality can tell us if it's good or bad or not. I'm sorry. So you mean, like, uh... So you said the starting point of it, right, is whether moral claims can be like proven true or, or like statements That's can be shown true. That's just the first divide in common metaphorical reasoning. Yeah. So why does it start over there? Why isn't it like something else? I.e., like whether it's good or bad, rather than if it can be shown if it's true or false. Well, because every ethical theory is trying to give a theory of good and bad, so it doesn't help us differentiate ethical theories by being like which ones say something is good or bad. Okay. So this divide is not saying you have to like argue for each of these things in a case. Yeah. This divide is just a way to think about right, it, how the like debates happen spatially, right, in terms of like who's debating with who. Right? And so the people who think morality is truth function, who don't think morality is truth function, don't debate with one another very much. It's not like Kantians out there being like constructivism and emotivism, like emotivism and they're trying to debate. No. They would just have to resolve if like morality can be true or false in the first place. So they wouldn't be debating like these lower down theories. Where does truth and falsity like come from in the first place? And like, how do we get to a place where we can decide if something is true or something is false? Well, that first question is just a metaphysical question. Yeah. Right. The second is an epistemological question, and there are lots of different theories about that, which I could explain in a four-hour lecture, but not now. David. Um, so theoretically, right? Let's say that we believe that um, somebody was running um, Aristotelian um, uh, naturalism, right? Would Aristotelian. To, Aristotelian naturalism. Mm -hmm. um, would we have to then eat why each of those down the, down the line is correct? Like, why would we have to first define no. why truth and why? Because frame of debate is comparative. So, if you were defending Aristotelian naturalism, and they were defending intuitionism, right? You would not have to debate if. Right, you should be a Cornell realist and Aristotelian. You just have to debate if you should base intuition on the natural world, or base my realist in the natural world, or naturalism. Mm -hmm. You also wouldn't have to answer like Euler theory or prescriptive. And if they're arguing quasi realism, and you're arguing quasi equilibrium, you don't have to resolve if it's true, uh, if it, uh, some more things are true, or if they're independent. You only have to resolve when you disagree, which is are they true that? 
So you only disagree about, you only debate about where you and your opponent disagree, not about every single premise, because frame integration is compare that, right? It's just all you and your friend was better than your opponents. But you could never justify all of these things. And so you just think about meta-ethics as a way to think about, you know, what sort of assumptions does my friend have in my friend's A couple of last things to reference that you should also be familiar with. There are other meta-ethical arguments that will appeal to things like, do humans have free will, right? Or what is the nature of persons? What is the nature of governments, right? What is the nature of the structure of the will? These are all other types of meta-ethical questions that don't fall into categorizing types of moral theories, but it instead claims that different moral theories have to account for. So those are also things you want to think about. I have a lecture on post-determined ethics. You can come to if you're interested in learning more about that particular stuff. And they will cover actual specific arguments rather than find an outline of how people have thought about these things in the past. So good to go to dinner.